folks, Joseph A. Sabara here, and as you may already know, the new Cinderella film is coming out on March 13 by Disney, which is a brand new live action adaptation of a popular classic fairy tale. But I want to review a much earlier adaptation of the same classic fairy tale, which is based in France, but it was also later adapted by the Brothers Grimm yeah, later on just to make it more magical but it's a film that was made in 1998 I mean they filmed it in 1997 yeah, perfect year for it and it came out in the summer of July 31st 1998 and it happens to be a favorite movie that I just never got tired of and I never will be because <laughs> I always enjoy fairy tale classics. Yeah. Not only do I love Disney, but I also love Grimm's fairy tale classics, the animated series from Japan, yeah, which aired on Nickelodeon, and of course I even love to read the books. And that happens to be my favorite film of that year called Ever After A Cinderella Story. That's right. This is a movie that was taking a classic retelling of the Cinderella story that's done in 16th century France, yeah, the Renaissance era as I mentioned. Only this time, Cinderella is actually the character named Danielle. And she's played wonderfully by Drew Barrymore in one of her best performance in any other decade between the 80s and 90s yeah, and and so on nevertheless this became one of my favorite films from her right after films like E.T. the Extraterrestrial, uh, Firestarter and and even other films like The Wedding Singer, Never Been Kissed and even uh, <laughs> Fifty First Dates yeah. I also liked her in, in movies like Titan A.E. when she did uh, some voice acting all of the other reindeer too, yeah, that was a, a, a very classic a Christmas special that came out in 1999. In fact, she produced it, by the way, by her production company, Flower Films, and many others that she'd done. But this movie, however, was a very powerful one and very well made and totally blows away all the other adaptations of many fairy tales that we're getting later in the millennium. And I agree, they were horrible. Although some of them were good, though. So, but not all, all of them. <laughs> anyway, this is of course the Blu-ray edition of Ever After a Cinderella Story. And the transfer of this movie, well, it's not exactly as good as as it uh, once was. But at at the same time, it's still, you know, sharp. It looks um, very stunning, and it did have a lot of grain in this you know, here and there. But it still looks as good as it came out in theaters in 1998. But maybe someday Fox will probably get a remaster of this, but otherwise, I, I think it's fine. I mean, it, it doesn't look too bad. It, it does look a little better than the DVD version that I got, which is right here, yeah, which came with a slip cover, yeah, which I really, really loved to own somehow at the time before the Blu-ray came out. and. Then, which looks exactly like this. <laughs> now here's something that you're gonna be laughing your socks off because if you look at the back the running time actually says a hundred minutes. I should know because when I first saw this movie I know for the fact that this movie was a two hour and one minute movie. Yeah which would be a hundred and twenty one minutes which that's what it says on this blu-ray right here. I swear to God, Fox must have had done a big mistake by misprinting the running time of the same movie because they really, I think they really made an obviously mistake. Because if this movie was a hundred minutes, they would have cut out the last scene of the film. So we don't want that because I had the feeling it wouldn't be a happy ending towards it. And that wouldn't make any sense. I was happy I owned this movie 
because I never get tired of it and it looks as stunning as it once was. It had a wonderful good score by George Fenton and I think that guy did a very good job, you know, adding the music towards it. Very good soundtrack. It just feels like what a fairy tale should really be. We even got a handsome prince who's uh, the crown prince of France. Of course his father was a king who's basically <laughs> wants the, the prince to get married and <laughs> sort of in that different way because I don't blame him but it's a lot different than any other Cinderella story I've ever seen and definitely blows away that shitty Hillary Duff movie yeah which was a modern day one yeah set in in today's generation well even though it was 2000 but what can you do this is the real deal. Okay, well, let's get to the review because I am really excited to review this film. I, I just never get tired of it. It stars Drew Barrymore with Angelica Houston. You know, definitely her finest performance as the evil stepmother. Yeah, in fact, it's right up there with her role in The Witches. Yeah. Dougray Scott, who, who later went on to play the villain in Mission Impossible 2. He also went on to do the film Taken Free, yeah, most recently. Yeah, he came a long way since then. Making Dodds, Melanie Lipsky, Patrick Goffrey, who's very good at, as the role of Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah, very wise and very powerful. Yeah, in fact, it's sort of like a take on on the fairy godmother, and he might as well be. <laughs> Except he's more like the fairy godfather in this version. And he's very good too because he's been in several films mostly uh, the ones that are produced by Merchant Ivory such as The Room of the View, The Remains of the Day and also he was he was in the original Doctor Who. Hard to believe that was him. Um, Timothy West, Julie Puffett, Richard O'Brien, Toby Jones, Jeremy Krupe, Lee Engelby, and Peter Gunn. It's written by Susanna Grant with Rick Parks and Andy Tennant who's the co-writer of the film and he's also the director of this film too as well and he happens to be the director who did films like It Takes Two which was a a parent trap ripoff if, if you ever saw one with the Olsen twins he later went on to direct the movie Fools Wash In you know, with Matthew Perry from Friends and Selma Hayek yeah, and he later went on to direct the movie Anna and the King. And he also later went on to direct some terrible films like Fool's Gold and The Bounty Hunter. You know, that, that was a terrible film. He did direct the movie uh, Sweet Home Alabama, though. And that was a great film with uh, Reese Witherspoon and Patrick Dempsey. The movie begins set in 19th century France. The British Grimm had attended inside Grande Dame's Marie Therese's palace in which they're discussing about their adaptation of a Cinderella story. But then the Brothers Grimm had discovered a Leonardo da Vinci's painting of a young woman and then Marie had showed them a glass slipper and tells the true story of Cinderella that's set in the 16th century France where we meet a young woman by the name of Danielle de Barbaric, who is played by Drew Barrymore. And as the story begins, Danielle was eight years old, and she was ready to meet her father, Augustus, where he just came from a wedding and marries a stepmother named Romella de Gaunt, who is played by Angelica Houston along with, with her two young daughters Margaret and Jacqueline. She has soon had received a present from her father which happens to be a book called Utopia. By the time her father left with his horse he has soon had suffered a heart attack and dies very quickly right in front of Danielle and everybody else which leads to one of the biggest issues as the years have followed because ten years later 
Danielle has turned 18 and has grown up to become what seems to be a servant to her stepmother and her stepsisters. Yeah, which apparently Marguerite was very hostile to Danielle. Romilla was treating her like her slave and while Jacqueline of course, while being, you know, a little overweight but not as much, is being the nice one to all to the stepmother and stepsister to Danielle you know basically she's very kind but she doesn't want to get involved in all the action that's between these two and wants to keep her peace to herself you know in that sort of way. Now, Jacqueline was very nice and she does you know treat Danielle in that sort of way and she definitely deserves that because it's such a shame that you know out of all stepsisters these days, I'm glad we have one that's really nice and not nasty like Margaret was. During that morning, you know, she was going around, you know, picking some apples, you know, doing all these chores for them and so on and so forth, along with all the workers involved. She had then had discovered a thief who actually stolen her father's horse and suddenly she froze an apple on the thief only to find out that it turned out to be Prince Henry, the Crown Prince of France, who's played by Doug Ray Scott. Which basically Prince Henry was just, you know, running away from from having to deal with all of his problems with the King Francis and Queen Marie of France because they actually wanted uh, Prince Henry to marry a Spanish princess named Gabriella. Danielle had definitely made a mistake. And he, and he was begging her for forgiveness. But then Henry decided to pretend like none of this had happened. And to keep her silent, he had to give her a bag of gold for exchange, which is really cool. So she decided to use the money just to rescue their servants, Maurice. So anyway, Henry had escaped from the duties of the court that all of a sudden he was being encountered by a band of gypsies who winds up robbing an old man, which turned out to be Leonardo da Vinci, you know, the artist, who then finally has been summoned to court and then returns with him. So he finally got his painting, which turned out to be Mona Lisa. Danielle has dressed as the lady of the court and gone by to buy back Maurice, but the guards have refused saying that he's being deported to the New World colonies. So she argues for his release, and when Henry overhears what's going on, he orders Maurice's release, and then he was very amazed by Danielle's intelligence that it turns out that he begs for her name, and it turns out that Danielle was using her mother's name as a secret name, Comtesse Nicole de Lancret. So that leads to what's going on, which then, you know, all the noble families had had invited an invitation to the masquerade ball as that was coming up, and they suddenly thought that Danielle might be interested you know, for the masquerade. When she started collecting truffles and all this other stuff, she wants up meeting Henry again. After, you know, she was starting to swim inside the river, you know, doing all of her breaststroke techniques. Yeah, she, she was swimming with her clothes on. And suddenly she was already discovered by Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> by walking into water by using those two wooden boats. And he was actually uh, telling uh, Danielle that it's soon going to rain. And then she screams and, <laughs> and then they all fell in, into the river. <laughs> Which then Henry suddenly uh, helped out and and picked Leonardo da Vinci and, and Danielle out of the river, and they started to meet once again and and they were engaged in a lively debate before Daniel runs off once again. <laughs> yeah, Henry decided to search for her all, and and try to invite her into the library that's nearby a monastery. You know, just talking about what's going on and everything. And then on their way home, they're being accused by the gypsies. And they're going around chasing them around, you know, doing a lot of crazy stuff. 
it where you know Danielle was already on top of uh, of the cliff, you know, near the trees and everything, while she took off her her uh, <laughs> her clothes, and leave out her undergarments. Yeah, she then finally went down. They one of the gypsies took her clothes and and he was demanding, you know, demanding the the gypsies to to give her her clothes and and leave Henry B and ask them to bring in their horse so they can leave until suddenly <laughs> you know she picks up Henry and they laugh all together and offer them a horse so then they wind up spending the night in the gypsies camp where they were playing the rock paper scissors and they actually share their very first kiss and, and they were raged to be met again in which Prince Henry would say how about we meet again and she says, I should try. And he also says, I should wait all day. Yeah. But the next morning arrives and everything seems to get even worse as as Danielle has been catched by the Baroness and Marguerite had stole her mother's dress. Yeah, in which by the time Marguerite had said that her mother was dead, Danielle had blown a fuse and actually punches her in the face yeah which gave her a black eye and then all of a sudden you know Danielle started chasing Margaret all the way around and, until she took uh, her father's book and and was demanding to throw it inside the fireplace if he demands to give her her mother's shoes you know because she took her her mother's shoes away from her well yeah, you know, she had to be forced into it, and then, and then suddenly Margaret just just wants to throwing the book inside the fireplace anyway, which leads her to bigger problems because then, you know, Romilla wants up, um, you know, wants up whipping her. I, I know this was off screen; they never show it, but she actually ripped her in the back, so she had a lot of scars. Uh, on her back, and Jacqueline was about to heal her, telling her, you know, everything that that she just said. You know, she should have never had said it. You know, she was being very mean and, and cruel. Yeah. So yeah. So then, by that time, you know, Danielle finally came back to meet Henry and to telling him about what was happening, and they and they said not to meet again. Yeah, until things get settled and hopefully who knows what's going to happen but that's what it gets even worse when Marmella and, and Margaret had decided to go to the ball you know with Jacqueline but after Danielle refused to have Margaret wear her mother's dress for the ball Marmella had got so mad that she decided to throw Danielle inside a pantry and lock her inside which then Leonardo da Vinci had arrived I had to open the the pantry and actually offer her to go to the ball, the masquerade ball, and, and find a pretty dress that turns out to have a pair of wings along with her mother's dress and slippers to go with it so that way she'll be as we speak. Already getting ready to go to the ball so she can meet her prince. And then once she finally arrived, yeah, she's even saying the word, just breathe. And when Prince Henry Finally meets uh, beautiful Danielle, already dressed up. Yeah, suddenly um, the Morella and Margaret had, had reveals the truth about her identity. Yeah, in front of Henry before Danielle can. Shocked and rage over her deception, Henry refused to any explanations from her, which caused her to feel very heartbroken. So Danielle decided to flee from the castle, losing one of her glass slippers, which Leonardo had found it, and reprimands Henry for his attitude, so then he winds up leaving the glass slipper, realizing Danielle might be his match. So Henry calls off the reading, you know, to Gabriella during the midsummer morning, found out that Romilla had sold Danielle to a land downer named Pierre Lepeu, who, of course, which I had met earlier in the film, 
and trying to grab all the all the fruits and everything. And after he sees Danielle leaving Pierre's mansion, he apologized for his ignorance and all the stuff and decided to propose to her by putting the glass slipper on. You know, cries in her arms and she got married later on and decided to send the Baroness along with Margaret as their punishment to work by doing all their chores and everything for, for the king, queen, prince, and, and of course, princess. And then everything turned out okay for Danielle and, and Henry, and they all live happily ever after. <laughs> the end. Now this is exactly how you retell a Cinderella story right. I mean, okay, maybe a little right, but this is exactly how it's supposed to be. It's a lot different from any other adaptations that we've seen, but this one knows how to do it with justice and style. Even though it was sort of said in a post-feminism uh, world that's in the Renaissance era, I knew exactly what the film was going for. I mean, at least we get a Cinderella that's strong, but she can rescue herself towards them, feeling more independent, more protective, and be able to to deal with what's going on and before, you know, falling in love with a true handsome Prince Charming in that sort of way. And I love what Drew Barrymore's character has really done you know, as Danielle. And this is definitely, without a doubt, one of Drew Barrymore's best performance. And she did a very excellent job playing that role with, with smart intelligence and very, very beautiful. That's what we need these days. We don't need any of this garbage that's following towards it. We need someone that's really smart. And that's what she plays. And I love Barry Moore's, I believe, uh, French or British accent in that sort of way. But it's supposed to be French. You know, she is from France and it would have made quite sense if it just given that way. I really enjoy that accent that she has. It's definitely perfect for her. Not something I expect to hear because, you know, she is an American actress. She knows exactly what she was doing. And I really enjoyed it. It, it was definitely, without a doubt, her best performance. I, I also enjoy Angelica Houston's cruel stepmother's character, Romilla, you know, also known as the Bardness. You know, she's definitely the, the perfect choice to play an evil stepmother. This hard, cruel, but not something as creepy as, as she played in The Witches. But this is definitely the right choice for her to do. And I really enjoy that. I also love uh, Doug Ray Scott playing the handsome Prince Charming Henry, you know, who's the Crown Prince of France. He did a very good job playing that role, exactly how, how the prince is supposed to be. I mean, it's funny because I never thought that this prince would definitely, you know, comes across, you know, feeling what the way he's feeling and, and having to deal with all that. Yeah, and I just, I really admire. And, and also the fact that he's very tough, too, and strong, and not just those typical, you know, boring Prince Charming characters, you know. But, I know, I know, I don't want to get to that. But still, this is exactly what a prince should definitely be, you know, towards his attitude. And I always love those lines that he comes up with, too. Yeah, especially when his father, uh, King Francis, was telling him, You're the crown prince of France! And he says, And it is my life. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because, you know, at first he didn't want to marry... Uh, a Spanish princess um, by the name of Gabriela, yeah, because he felt like he didn't want to deal with it so much. But I know that's pretty much how the story goes, because, you know, you know, the king wants, you know, the prince to be married with a, with a princess, you know, so everything could be live happily ever after. But he wants to live independently, you know, before he gets to all this. 
Yeah. That is until he, you know, he finally meets Danielle. Yeah, a much beautiful princess. But I gotta say, one of the most funniest scenes in that film was when, <laughs> when he was about to get married to Gabriella. Yeah, <laughs> Gabriella was like crying and and screaming because you could tell that she didn't really want to get married. And I know it, it was hilarious too. I, I love that scene too. And and there, the movie has actually had a lot of great scenes too, especially with. Um, Patrick Goffrey's performance as Leonardo da Vinci. I mean, this is definitely his charming, finest performance and all the work that he's been doing since he was in Doctor Who and, and all the other films that he's been doing in the UK. I, I gotta say, everything that he was doing, I feel like he stole so many scenes when he was playing Leonardo da Vinci, you know, trying to, you know, cheer up um, Danielle and everything and you know, like, like, he is his uh, fairy godmother. Even though it's godfather, I would say. But everything he was doing was, was cool. Uh, very icing in the cake. You know, you love to see him actually painting the painting that he was coming up with. And, and the fact that he's he, he's walking around with those uh, two wooden boats. It was just amazing. This was his finest performance. I think he really did stole the show for me. But I really enjoyed the music, which is a beautiful score that they added for the film and everything that they went to. The setting was spectacular. It all set in France. You know, it had a lot of beautiful monasteries and a lot of houses around. And even that one particular palace that they used for the film. I really admired that that the director Andy Tennant had to use the, that one particular set to use for a Cinderella story and that works like a charm I love that this is definitely what a movie should be made and I'm glad that this movie got made it was perfect the best fairy tale adaptation I've ever seen and I never get tired of it it's such a beautiful film um, definitely check this film out on VHS DVD Blu-ray and hell even Netflix TV and all the rest because it's really one true fantasy they didn't need any of all the special effects that they had in the film in fact you can pretty much picture all of this in your mind that they use all of that because they didn't have any of that for this movie they it's supposed to be a modern retelling of the story they need they didn't need any special effects it was perfect and it worked so well. I mean, I'm surprised it took them two months to film the entire movie this way for one year. One year alone, because you were expecting this movie was going to take like a year or maybe two to, to film plenty of these scenes. They didn't need that. So that's how they did it. And that's exactly how films are supposed to be. So yeah, I mean... Not that I'm against of CGI or any of the other special effects, but the fact is, this is what a Cinderella movie is supposed to be. You know? Or any other fairy tale movie out there. We don't need this. But that's okay, because I do love some of the films that they had that uses special effects with CGI and all that, so I'll take my chances. But this, my friend, is what a film should be. Oh, and just to keep that in mind, though, uh, the DVD and Blu-ray release of Ever After Cinderella Story, however, doesn't have any special features whatsoever other than the trailer, which actually features some two good songs. I know they're not in the movie, though. I wish they were, because they work so well. Yeah, I wish that was part of the soundtrack. And it's certainly better than any of the adaptations that follow after this movie such as the Cinderella story another Cinderella story with Selena Gomez um, and hell even Ella Enchanted with Anne Hathaway although I think at least that movie as a comedy and everything at least it was a lot better than the Cinderella story with fucking Hilary Duff because I hate that bitch she's really freaking annoying 
Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry I curse, but who cares? Yeah, I don't, I don't like her. And it's way better than any of the other adaptations that came out in the early 2010s. You know, although I love Mirror Mirror, though Mirror Mirror was a great Snow White adaptation. Unlike any of those stupid films that we had, like Beastly, uh, Red Riding Hood, Snow White and the Huntsman, Hansel and Gretel, Witch Hunters. I mean, what the hell is with Hollywood these days and these crappy fairy tale adaptations that's done in a crappy way? Exactly. And we don't need that crap. Okay? That's what's wrong with Hollywood today. They can't come up with something original that's done right. Okay, I'm sorry I'm, I'm kind of going overboard on that, but you know how I felt. I had to sit for these trash adaptations already, and I don't need that. But let's get to the point. Check out Ever After a Cinderella Story. You'll never forget. It's a good movie. It's definitely one of the best in my opinion, or anybody else's, and you never get tired of it. So anyway, I give this film a solid, enchanting, delight, five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye. And remember, just breathe.